Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We had started off with a reading club where we were reading through some of the Islamic books. What's important to realize is that we as the Muslim Ummah, we are the Ummah of Iqra. The very first word that was revealed to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Iqra, which means read. And the best reading a person can do is uh, through that which pleases Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That would be by reciting the Quran. And obviously that would entail understanding the Quran and practicing upon it. And hence, from this ayah, as well as what we've been encouraged, uh, we started off with this small project where we choose a few books and we read through them. We started off with what's known as Mukhtasar. Mukhtasar is a summary or abridged uh, Ibn Kathir. So Ibn Kathir, as we mentioned before, is a scholar, famous scholar of tafsir, and he had written uh, his ex explanation of the Quran benefiting greatly from Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari is the imam of the Mufassirin. I'm not going to go through everything, but the point uh, of this session is, firstly, to share benefit with one another, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind, but well, definitely the reminder benefits the believers. Also, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when encouraging those who hear a hadith or those who hear a teaching, he encouraged them to convey this teaching and he gives a reason for this. He says that because it may be that a person who is receiving the message may be more knowledgeable than the one who is giving him that message. Sometimes the one who is hearing uh, down the chain, the second, third, fourth, may be more knowledgeable or may understand what's being meant by the verse or the hadith more than the one who may have actually heard it from the mouth of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A few pointers I'll go through. And then if there's any questions, uh, anybody wants to ask, if there's any pieces of benefit you felt were of great importance you want to share, also, if there's something you didn't understand or uh, at times there may be opinions you want to debate, feel free to. So I'll start off. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As we know that Surah Al-Fatiha, scholars differ as to whether it starts with Basmala or does it start straight with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. A few points I want to touch on. Firstly, is there is the tafsir of the Quran where a person, he knows the meaning and understands a little bit deeper some of the reasons of revelation, some of the ahkam. Then there's another uh, branch to this, which is called tadabbur, where a person reflects and is able to extract deeper meaning or deeper lessons. A few of these uh, verses we could reflect on. Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. He praises himself. He says, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then gives us a reason. One of the reasons is because he is the Lord. He is the one who created. He is the one who is in charge of every single thing that exists. If you take a moment to ponder over the most magnificent and the greatest being in existence, surely if he did all this, all praise is due to him. And this also shows us that at times it's important for us wherever possible to give a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that all praise is due to him and he also gave a reason. Second point I want to touch on is look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after mentioning that he is the Lord of all that exists. If you had to ponder over this, you, if you had to ponder how great the creation is, how great the universe is, how great the galaxy is, how great some of the other creatures and creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And on top of that, you're calling out to the one who created all these things. A person may be overtaken with fear. A person may be uh, taken aback. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. He is the most merciful. He is the most beneficent, the most merciful. And this shows us that there is a balance in the Quran between hope and fear. Not too much fear that a person loses hope completely and not too much hope that a person does as he pleases without obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we carry on through uh, the surah, you would find that uh, there were some ahkam that were mentioned. One of them is Imam ibn Kathir rahimahullah, or uh, in the tafsir ibn Kathir, as well as in the summarized version, they mention that uh, his opinion is 
it is compulsory for a person to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in Salah even if they are behind the Imam. Even if they are behind the Imam. And only that one opinion is mentioned. As we explained before, and I'll mention it again, there's more than one opinion when it comes to this. If a person is reading by himself in Salah, the safer opinion, uh, as long as he's able to memorize Fatiha or read Fatiha, the safest opinion is for him to recite that uh, Fatiha. The Hanafi Madhab, they say that a person doesn't necessarily have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. He can recite from wherever he wants to using the ayah, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنْ uh, as for a person in salah, in congregation, behind the imam, uh, again, some of the scholars mentioned that he must recite Surah Al-Fatiha, whether the salah is uh, jahri, where uh, the imam reads loudly, whether it's salah uh, sirri, where the imam reads softly. And some say, no, he doesn't have to read when it's uh, like dhuhr and asr. The salah is soft. However, in fact, some of them mention when Salah is soft, he has to read, and when it's loud, he doesn't have to read. Others go a step further to say that he doesn't have to read. Understand that this is fiqh, and there is a difference of opinion. Ask your local scholar, uh, and inshallah, they will guide you to uh, what they see as befitting, and you as a person who may be unable to go through the different evidences and uh, choose or what is correct or more correct, inshallah, you are safe and you are rewarded for following a person of knowledge. Another important muscle I want to touch on is at the end of Surah Al-Fatiha, a person says, Ameen. Uh, it's sunnah. It's not compulsory for a person to say, Ameen. And we find, again, there's a difference of opinion between the Hanafi Madhab and the others, uh, where the Hanafi Madhab say, a person says, Ameen, softly. Whereas the others say, person says amin loudly everybody has their pieces of evidence what's important to mention is a student of knowledge who is of understanding at times he may believe that saying amin loudly is the sunnah however if you're reading in a community or a masjid that don't understand that there is a second opinion they don't understand or they may uh, throw you under the bus just for saying amin loudly uh, here it may be from wisdom and tact to uh, follow them as you are not doing something haram. So if they're saying amin softly, you can say amin softly, and there's no harm for that. I think that's about it. There was one more question somebody asked when it came to the hadith that was mentioned, that there's three things that interrupt the salah, interrupt i.e. that break the salah, when uh, they pass in front of a musalli. Uh, as mentioned, there's a difference of opinion again. Uh, the Hanafi madhab as well as the... In fact, the majority opinion is the salah is not broken. However, the person who passes in front of this musalli would be sinful. Then well, what uh, uh, some of them go into detail where they say that if a person is performing salah, especially in a very vast area, let's say Masjid al-Haram, Masjid nabawi or in other big masajid, he only owns, i.e. only belongs to him that which is from his feet to his place of sajda. So if a person is ahead of him, two lines, three lines, he can pass through, and this is to make it easy for all those who are uh, who may be stuck, who may want to go quickly, etc. The Hanbali Madhab, they take the hadith literally, and they say that those three things break the salah. And then in the Hanbali Madhab itself, they have a few exceptions, some of the riwayat. So I hope that made it uh, clear. Does anybody want to, to ask anything or does anybody want to share any benefit? So uh, you mentioned there are uh, three reasons for the salah to break. One of them is someone passing in front of the musallim. What are the rest of the reasons did you mention? No, the, uh, in the hadith that mentions that three things break the salah. Yeah. What are those three yeah. things since you read? No, I haven't read the Islamic book. I've read the other one. The, the you read the other one. So I think what breaks the salah, I think from my experience, what I've heard, if someone's um, 
shirt goes up, the back shows. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This we're talking about a specific hadith. That hadith says that there's three things that break the salah. However, in terms of some uh, three things passing in front of a musalli, are there other things that break the salah? Of course there are. So for example, a person's awrah is completely uncovered. A person passes wind. A person, uh, let's say, he he has no reason and he moves away from the qibla. So a person is performing salah, facing qibla, and all of a sudden he decides to move all the way around. That would break his salah. So when it comes to uh, nawaqid al-salah, they, uh, they are many. We were just touching on that hadith. Remind us, what's the hadith? Al-Mar'ah, the hadith speaking about the three things that uh, break the salah. If a woman passes in front, and a black dog, and number three, Omar. Anybody else? Nobody else. You guys didn't read. There's also if mention about. Wudu, pardon? Uh, if the wudu breaks. And we're talking about the specific hadith that you guys were debating. What is the meaning of interrupts salah? Do you remember that or you don't remember? And somebody answered I recently. Don't you don't remember. Somebody had answered recently. Anyways, you guys can find that out. Remember that mas'ala and then inshallah you won't forget. Any other questions with regards to what we read? Said. Excellent. Well done. Donkey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was just uh, trying to unmute. Yes, I'm here. Just from the three things, somebody answered there in the chat. The uh, third one is the donkey mentioned in that hadith. Then those who say it doesn't break the salah, they have a hadith that says that nothing breaks the salah. Whatever passes in front of a person, nothing breaks the salah. Uh, there is a riwayah, the Hanbali Madhab, that says that, okay, we take that hadith, but then the Messenger وسلم, when he was reading salah, in his house and he went to make sajda because the house was so small uh, Aisha radiallahu anha says that when he would make sajda if my leg was in the way he would move my leg away so what does that mean that means she was in front of him so they would say okay that means uh, if a woman passes in front or a woman is in front not passing or well, won't break the salah as for the donkey then they mention that uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma I think Ibn Kathir also mentions this, that he pa was passing in Hajj. He was a youngster and he had a female donkey and that donkey was uh, walking between the sufuf. Uh, also, uh, an interesting mas'ala that comes up here is sometimes you find in the masajid, uh, a person may be performing salah and you want to pass in front of him and he'll stop you with his hand. And some people go as far as fighting uh, with the person trying to pass. And they use some hadith where the Messenger of Allah uh, mentions that a person should stop uh, somebody trying to pass in front of them. Hence you find sometimes you'll be reading and then, then somebody will put their hand like this or they'll shove you off uh, due to that hadith. But what's important to mention is, let's say you're late for salah. Try not to read in the doorway. There's people who want to go. There's people who want to move quickly. Also, if you're performing your salah in the masjid and somebody wants to pass and they're three, four meters in front of you, try not to stop them. Because at the end of the day, you are causing uh, a problem and you are causing uh, harm to others. And as for the person who wants to be passing or who wants to pass, it would be better for him to wait. And if he's able to put a sutra, a sutra is like a small barrier, in front of the person performing salah, uh, that would be best. So let's say there's a spare chair or there's a small desk that people perform, uh, people recite Quran with, you're able to put in front of this person and walk through, then it's fine. Yes, excuse me, Sheikh. 
Yes. Um, the hadith uh, that mentions the woman, the donkey, and the dog that passes yeah. in front of those. Uh, to what extent do the fuqaha also uh, apply this to uh, other animals, or is it specifically for the dog, the donkey, or do they also extend that? Uh... So those who uh, those who say that it doesn't break the salah, they have another hadith. I think it's in Dara Qutni. Where they say the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that nothing that passes in front of a Musalli breaks the Salah and they hold on to this Asl. Okay? And as for those say uh, those who say it breaks the Salah, then they hold on to this. This Any other questions with what we've taken? Anybody has an interesting piece of benefit to share? Something that you read? Or something that you didn't understand? Nobody? I found it interesting to see all the names that were summarized um, for the ones who say that the Bismillah is part of the uh, of the uh, Surah and those who, who uh, actually say that it's not part of the of the surah and those who say you have to uh, read it out loud and those who say uh, you say it in silence so it was a pretty extensive list that i think uh, even kathir uh, mentioned of the of the scholars so uh, yes i found that interesting to see it's so interesting that again as you mentioned uh, when it comes to some of these opinions we you'll see that the sahaba on the side who mentioned that it's not a verse from Fatiha. And there's a Sahaba on the other side who say it is a verse from Surah Al-Fatiha. And what we can learn from this is, uh, as I've told you guys many times before, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum amongst themselves, they differed. Even in the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and surely after he passed away. What's the difference? So why the difference? It's not only because somebody received an authentic hadith and somebody didn't know. It's not only that. It's also to do with the understanding of the person, how long they may have stayed with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Intelligence of people differs. Number four, they may have gone to a different land and seen that you don't want to apply. My understanding here is not possible. So let's apply uh, according to somebody else's understanding. And this is fiqh. You find that there is difference of opinion. There is a scope to differ. You can hold on to your opinion. Fighting over it uh, is not going to solve anything, whether it's the people who came before us are now debating, no matter how strong a debater you are, no matter how many verses in a hadith you may know, you're never ever going to solve uh, this to bring the whole ummah to one opinion. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The understanding uh, and the living circumstances of everybody is different. Also, something important is that here we're reading the summary of Ibn Kathir. So Iman Ibn Kathir itself, Tafsir Ibn Kathir. And then Ibn Kathir takes from At-Tabari and others, mainly At-Tabari. At-Tabari's Tafsir is very, very, very long. Also, uh, if you could benefit from these three in terms of ahkam, in terms of knowing the meaning and uh, some of the uh, masail in fiqh, At-Tabari, uh, Al-Qurtubi and Ibn Kathir. I don't know if any translations or summaries of them but they, they may be if you can read through those three uh, inshallah you'll gather a lot of knowledge yes yeah, I, I have the English version of uh, be it's being translated as we speak and they are now at the seventh volume I know I think they are not even halfway through the whole Quran so yeah it's being translated as we speak so yeah and Tabari it isn't it, it isn't translated, only, I think, a, a bridge version, very small, but, uh, yeah, I think that's the... Yeah, that's but sometimes it. At-Tabari, what he does is he gives you the opinion, okay? He says that this means this. For example, if he's talking about إِهْدِنَ uh, al-mustaqim, guide us to the straight path, then he's speaking about what is the straight path. And first he'll start by saying the straight path is Islam. Then he gives his whole isnad to say, who said this? So he'll say this person, and then this person, and then this person, and then this person. So he'll take, for example, one page. 
and then the next page you'll tell you and some people said Quran and the next page some people said uh, following the message of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but if you had to summarize these three pages you could summarize them into three lines so there's a yes. lot of Asanid also in uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir uh, Al-Qurtubi doesn't mention as many he, he does touch on Ahkam a lot and, but if you're able to benefit from these three, then uh, you benefit a lot, inshallah. Let me go to the chat here. She was sitting in the back and here. Uh, no, speaking about that hadith that I mentioned about Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that when the Messenger وسلم, wanted to make sajda, so if he's here in the front and he wants to make sajda, obviously she's going to be in front or her legs are going to be in front, so he's going to move her. How is it going to be at the back? And uh, the meaning of ibadah didn't seem to go into much detail. Can you go into more detail? So ibadah, lughatan, they say is from al-khudu' wa tadallul, where a person humbles himself. Uh, he brings himself down to a level of humbleness and humility. And in the sharia, one of the definitions is ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardah. Ibadah is an encompassing word which is referring to everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And this everything can be min al aqwali wal af'al, from anything that's being said or anything that's being done and whether this action is being done apparently or in the heart. So if you look at ibadah, uh, an encompassing uh, definition of ibadah is everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Does Allah love you to be Truthful, yes, he does. Does Allah love you to perform your salah? Yes, he does. Does Allah love that his servant uh, thinks good of him? Yes, he does. So all these things fall under ibadah. Sheikh, could you, could you maybe um, go into, uh, I think Ibn Kathir doesn't go into this, but or not extensively, but could you explain some more about the the word Maliki Omidin? And whether Maliki is referred to as king or as a sovereign, because uh, there are, I think it's in the uh, different readings, the Kira'at, that uh, there are also different meanings in that word Maliki or Maliki. So Malik, Could you maybe go into that? Which one is was the was the um, the most used uh, definition? Or yeah. So Malik is from owner, okay, and Malik is king. Okay, Malik, and there's two ways of reciting that verse. Maliki Yomiddin and Maliki Yomiddin. Malik, if you had to translate here, you're going to say the owner of the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who owns that day. Does he own all other days and everything else? Yes, he does. But why is that day specified? Because nobody else will be able to claim ownership on that day. The other way of reciting is Maliki Yomiddin. King, the only king on the day of judgment some scholars mentioned that maliki encompasses maliki also so it's got even more meaning because it shows ownership and it shows that he alone is in charge he alone is the king and nobody else can claim kingdom on that day and it's uh, two ways of reading two ways of reciting uh, both are correct and uh, some, that's why sometimes when you go to certain countries, you'll hear them reading Maliki or Medin. It's also correct. The meaning slightly differs. One is more encompassing of the other, but uh, they very close. Nozha, you had a question? Uh, yes, I wanted to share that uh, when when someone knows what he, he or she is reading in Salat, it has more weight like uh, not just you are reciting the Arabic but you know the meaning also when we go when we went in the books we learn the meaning we learn the tafsir also it has more weight like it's a salah is a conversation between you and Allah but if you don't know what you are saying it's not it's not really a, a conversation I think there is more uh, benefit when you know what you are saying what you are reading Inside. Well done. That's a very valid point. That when you're reciting, obviously you've got to know what you are reading. That's why uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in more than one verse he says, "Afala yatadabbarun al Quran." Do they not ponder over the Quran? He mentions the reason for the Quran having been revealed. He says, "Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarak." 
ليدبروا آياته. Allah revealed the Quran. He sent it down for the people to ponder over the verses. If you don't understand, if you don't understand, how are you going to ponder over these verses? If you don't understand the Quran, hence it's important uh, for whoever is able to learn Arabic. If you're unable to at least go through the English like this, and I would encourage you guys, whatever you've read, these 60 pages, summarize them into one page, two pages. Then you've got always uh, with you anytime you want to see your uh, meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha. You forget, for example, or every one to two weeks, every month, you go over and you renew and you refresh. And that way, uh, in your Salah, uh, you'll be able to understand exactly what you're reading. And also, in your uh, day to day life, you'll understand, you have a bond with the Quran and develop your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well done. Anybody else? No more uh, questions? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's about, like, it was written over here that um, Al Fatiha contains. Seven ayah and Bismillah is a separate ayah in its beginning. So I'm confused that uh, every time when we recite any surah, we read Bismillah first. So uh, it says that Bismillah is uh, is a separate ayah in its beginning. So it's the part of Al Fatiha. But uh, whenever we recite any other surah as well, as well we start it with Bismillah. So I'm a little confused about it here that how we can defer it. Okay, so when it comes to Bismillah, firstly, all the scholars agree. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim is a verse in Surah An-Naml. Surah An-Naml, uh, the 19th Jews, Sulaiman alayhi salam, when he writes to the queen of uh, Saba, he says, Innahu min Sulaiman. In his letter, he says this is from Sulaiman, and he starts off by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So all the scholars agree that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of the Quran in Surah An-Naml. They then differ: Is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim a verse of, uh, at the beginning of every single surah or not? So we've already agreed that it comes in the 19th Jews, Surah Al-Naml. They then have another mas'ala. Is Surah Al-Fatiha the very first verse of every single surah or not? Those who say it's one of the verses of the surah, you'll find in Salah, for example, they recite loudly before starting any surah. Uh, there's, some, there's some who say that. Then there's others who say uh, it's a verse from Surah Al-Fatiha. Hence, they would recite Surah Al-Fatiha, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, loudly. Now, getting to your question, I'm sure this what you're also asking is, if they say that Surah Al-Fatiha contains seven verses, bil ittifaq, that everybody agrees, uh, if you're adding Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, surely that's eight verses, it's not seven. So the answer to that is, those who say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, is a verse of the Qur'an uh, and a verse from Surah Al-Fatiha. That would be ayah number one. However, uh, when they recite by اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Here they don't stop. So, صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Here we would count it as two verses and they count it as one. So if you count that as one verse, and if you count Bismillah as a verse, you would reach seven verses. And those who say no, uh, Surah uh, Bismillah is not a verse from Surah Al-Fatiha, they will tell you that Surah al ladina An'amta Alayhim, stop, that's verse number six, غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين, verse number seven. Also, it's uh, recommended. And uh, it's for those who say it's not a verse from Surah Al-Fatiha or any other surah, uh, they say that it's recommended, it's the practice of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to recite uh, Basmala as well as the Sahaba before every single surah, except surah Tawbah, Bara'atum min Allahi wa Rasulih, that surah. We hope that answers your question. Yes, 
Yeah. Any other question in the chat? If anybody got anything to say or to share? How did you find reading? Was it enough or was it too little? Can we increase in the next book? Uh, are you talking about the complete pages of the book? Pardon? Uh, are you talking about the complete book? Yeah. So the, this, we've, we've read Surah Al-Fatiha right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to go on to a different book, a book in the Seerah, which is a little bit longer. A few, a few reasons. Number one is that uh, it's been written in English and edited in English. Edited in English. So if you look at the book we read, it's somebody's translation. It's a decent translation and you would understand it more if you read the Arabic. If you haven't read the Arabic, there's certain verses, certain paragraphs that you're not going to comprehend fully what he's trying to get at because the translation is not uh, 100%. It's not uh, magnificent. It's not great. I mean, it's it's really good, but uh, that's one of the reasons. Mm. Till, till today, I don't know of uh, a good... When I'm talking about a good, I'm talking about close to on par with uh, an Arabic explanation, uh, something in English, I, I don't know of one. Because a lot of the times when you read in Arabic, and then when you read in uh, English, there's certain verses that need to be explained. At times, the person translating can make a mistake. At times, the person... Uh, translating he may have a good grasp of the english english language but not the arabic language and at times it may be the opposite way they may know the arabic but they're unable to put it into english so if you guys know of any good or brilliant translation of the quran and more than a translation tafsir uh, you can let me know I still haven't found one in English which you could compare. I think uh, IIPH, they tried to translate Tafsir al-Sidi. But remember, uh, Sidi, he he gathered from Al-Tabari, Qutub ibn Kathir and others, and then he he summarized all those. So he doesn't, he doesn't ever quote anybody. He mentioned the verse, and he has a lot of good imaniyat where... Uh, it mentions things that would increase your iman however on big projects like that you find there's not only one person translating there's different people so everybody's given a few pages a few pages a few pages and you can see when somebody else has translated and somebody else uh, uh, somebody else is translating you see the difference in it uh, Sheikh I have uh, one more uh, question like, yes. uh, as I was reading about the ablution, that there is no valid ablution for he who did not mention Allah's name in it. But uh, nowadays, as we see that we have the, uh, most of the time we have the uh, washrooms, like a test washroom. We, we, Sorry, uh, your, your, your sound is going near and far. If you have your mic, just speak into your mic, please. Yeah, yeah, I am audible now. Okay. Uh so reciting basmala at the beginning of wudu yeah. is not compulsory. Yes, there's some people who say there's a hadith uh, as mentioned in the tafsir. Uh, when Ibn Kathir is speaking about the verse of wudu in Surah Al-Ma'idah, they speak about this. Is basmala compulsory when making wudu or not? And added to this masala is gargling and cleansing the nose compulsory or not so what they'll mention is they'll say the ayah of wudu says فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَإِدْيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقْ وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ the ayah of wudu mentions four things wash the face, hands to the elbows wipe the head and wash the feet those four are compulsory okay, everybody agrees there then anything extra here there's those who take the hadith and they'll add to it. So they'll say, this from the hadith we take uh, gargling and cleansing the nose, so those are also compulsory. And some of them will also hold on to basmala. But then they'll say that basmala is sunnah, 
And if a person forgets, it's okay. So what's compulsory is the four. Uh, gargling and cleansing the nose according to the Hanafis, Shafis, Malikis is not compulsory. The Hanbali Madhab says compulsory. Is it safer to gargle and cleanse your nose? Yes, it is. My point is, sometimes you may read a text like that to say that wudu is not valid if a person doesn't read basmala. Then a person may take it literally and uh, go to apply it and go to preach it to everybody else and then their wudu uh, is not valid. Whereas if they went deeper into it, there's people who say, no, that hadith is uh, not valid, it's weak, we don't take by it. Or even if it was, there's the hadith of the Arabi where the Messiah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, told him to do these four things uh, there was no madmadan Istin Shaq mentioned there was no basmala mentioned hence they would say okay if you really want to then it's uh, sunnah and getting to your point that if the person is in the bathroom let's say a person wants to read basmala uh, if they're in the bathroom uh, and let's say they hear the adhan also some scholars say you reply from your heart so without without talking so the muaddin is saying Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar and in your heart without moving you can reply others say you keep quiet any other question yeah i just wanted to ask um do you know of that uh, translation of the quran by bridges it's called bridges foundation or bridges publishing no. They are based in uh, Saudi. You have the uh, translation, and it's called the Ten Kiraat of the of the Quran. So, whenever there is a, a multiple meaning of a word, then they give a little footnote. They don't go into into detail about the meaning of the of these words, but they will let you know that uh, there are uh, multiple meanings for one word. But they will also have. Uh, Every time that it says you, it will show you if it's plural or a singular. So I mean, I those are... that's the thing that a lot of translations miss from the with the, with the, the English because it's it's difficult in English to differentiate between singular and plural when it refers to you. So I think that's uh, something important. So it's good that there there is an effort. There's a lot of people are making an effort when it comes to. Uh, trying to put a lot more detail, trying to explain a lot more, uh, but there's still work to be done. There's, the, uh, there's one verse I'll tell you, go and look at. There's two verses, go and look at. In Surah Al-Kahf, go open the English Qur'ans and look at the verse, وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكٌ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا It's towards the end of Kahf. Go and find out uh, go and look at the English translations and tell me to tomorrow when we have a lesson what they say. And also in the first Jews just before, about halfway, uh, the verse, Go and find the translation of that and come and bring it to me. Then, from there, I want you to compare what's written in even the most basic of uh, Arabic, where it's, uh, for example, Tafsir al muyassar from the Mujamma or al Muhtasar fi Tafsir. And see the, see the difference. Those, they, they add a few words which uh, make the meaning uh, more correct. So that will be the last part of Surah Al Kaf. So, no, yeah, the last part, the end of the 15th Jews. وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكٌ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا The beginning of the 16th Jews. Yes. Anything else? No more questions? I was asking that, uh, is it enough to read or can we read more? The next book is a long book, but inshallah you'll enjoy it. The book What's on the What's the name of the other book? Uh, I think it's called كَيْفَ عَامَلَهُمْ in Arabic. It's how the Messiah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated others. And in English, he translated the book as Interactions of the Greatest Leaders. It's a long book, but it's a lovely book. For me, it's never any problem, so uh, I don't mind. So it will increase, inshallah. Uh, somebody had a question. Somebody wanted to share something. Nobody? 
yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, please, can you explain uh, Surah Fatiha as a sh called as a Shifa or a Rukhya? Okay, so from Surah Al Fatiha is mentioned in the books of Tafsir. Uh, one of its names is a Shifa, which means the cure. And a ruqya, which means it's, it was used to recite or can be used to recite. And as we know, ruqya, uh, if a person is suffering from jinn, evil eye, mass, uh, magic, etc., uh, when a person is read upon, so you recite the Quran, you do ruqya on them. Uh, and bi uh, a person is cured and it helps their situation. So uh, the Quran as a whole, is shifa. Allah says, we revealed in the Quran that which is uh, cure. Cure for what? Cure for everything. Physical ailments as well as uh, spiritual ailments. Ailments of the heart. Diseases of the heart. And the hadith mentioned is where some of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. Now this is, this is an evidence to use to show that Surah Al-Fatiha can be recited on somebody who is sick, somebody who is suffering from a physical ailment, and bi uh, they would be cured. So uh, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were traveling, and uh, they were passing by a village, and this village refused to host them. And then uh, the chief of the village was stung. So they asked, is there anybody who can do ruqya? Now, it was known amongst those people in those days that there's something called ruqya. At times, they would do ruqya with that which was not from the Qur'an. I'm talking about the people of Jahiliya, through uh, spirits, through jinn, through shayateen, etc. So they knew what was uh, ruqya. So the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, one of them said, yes, I can do ruqya. And he recited Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, and this chief was cured. It's as though he came out of what's called an iqal. Iqal is where you hold the camel and uh, the hand is held. And uh, it was like he, this was untied and he had energy to move. So uh, some of the Sahaba, they were unsure. And after he did this ruqya, he was, they were given some sheep. So they were unsure about this. So they went to the Messenger of and he said, how do you know it was a ruqya? I, it is a ruqya. How did you know? Then uh, with what they had uh, attained in terms of sheep, he said that, uh, it's okay, and he said to show them that it was halal and okay for what they took, he says, give me a share from it. So this hadith teaches us that there is shifa and cure in Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, and it's used to recite on somebody who is sick. Now, sometimes people say that uh, I recite my duas and I recite this and that, and I still get sick or I'm still harmed. If a person has a weapon, a very strong weapon, but they themselves are weak. They're not trained to use that weapon. How can they take full benefit from that weapon? They can't. So when a person's iman is strong, his conviction is strong, his tawakkul and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how it's supposed to be, then he is or she is the person who benefits the most from uh, this ruqya and this Quran. Also when the Messiah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was uh, done magic on uh, Jibreel alayhi salam taught him uh, falaq and nas as uh, ruqya as shifa to read on himself so when we're talking about ruqya that's what we're talking about person uh, reads ayat from the Quran uh, and bi'ithnillah it would help and get cured for those who were here previously I'd, I'd explained to you how sihr works how magic works how jinn work how at times, if it's very strong magic, there are a few ways to open magic. First is if you find the, the knots themselves, then uh, you say, oh, Bismillah, and you cut open through those knots and those things. At times, the jinn themselves, they want to leave the one that's been trapped because they also punished and they burn when uh, the Quran is read, etc. So at times, uh, they leave. But sometimes, the uh, sihr is very strong, the knot is very strong. So the first time you read, it may just open a little bit. And then you have to carry on, you have to persist, it may open a little bit, it gets weaker, weaker. Then if you leave, it gets stronger. Uh, if there's sin, etc., it gets stronger. And we went into this in detail. So, uh, yes. Uh, Nuzha. Um, 
الشيخ وانوي سي بسم الله انوي اوبن ذا نوكس ذا نوتس شود وي بوت دعاء واتر اون ات او شود وي بيرن ات او اتس سفيشنت اف وي جاست اوبن ذا نوت Uh, it's sufficient if you cut the knot, open the knot, but you, some people do put water on it and some people do, uh, do burn it. But you have to make sure you open the knot. Okay, jazakallah khairi. Okay. Which no. verse of the Quran are you, are you recommending to recite when you're cutting the knot? You see here, there's no sunnah, there's no... Uh, Worried, nothing said from the Messenger of Allah, Sallam, but through people's ijtiha, they will say, we'll start in the name of Allah. Or some people say that, uh, it's not a verse of the Quran. Others say, uh, Musa ma Allah, sayubtiluh, inna Allah, inna Allah, Allah will destroy it, etc. If a person uh, doesn't need to do ruqya on anybody, uh, it would be a door that you best not get into. It's... But, um, the Sheikh, some people, they, it's not really sihr. They're going through mental illness. Like, would it be better yes. to go to a psychiatrist, a doctor? If you have a heart issue, you don't go to an island. You go to a doctor. If you have it depends. mental issue, depression, go to a... It depends what they diagnosed with. Some people have a lot of waswasa where they believe everything is sihr. Uh, at times, at times, due to a mental illness, so sometimes it is mental completely, sometimes due to a mental illness, a person may have both. So a person uh, may be possessed, uh, having done sihr on and it may be a mental illness, both. And then there's different types of sihr, different types of magic. There's magic uh, that's to bring husband and wife together. There's that which brings them apart. There's that which makes a person dislike something. There's that which uh, makes a person go mad. There's that which is meant to kill a person. There's different There's different reasons when it comes to magic. But uh, if you haven't been into the story, it's best you carry on reading your duas and say far away from it. No. I've seen some. <laughs> You're right. Some people, some people is is mental illness. Mm. No, I've Any seen actual Christmas? magic. You know the stuff reading and stuff. A long time ago. Uh, but some some are um, some is not magic. Sometimes it's it's deception of the eye. Some people have deception of the eye in a circus and that type of thing. A person is eating a snake or they moving this and a lot of these things now with youtube if you look at them they 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 show you how the person is is deceiving you so in the cup they've got things stuck inside and they're showing there's nothing and then they open it etc all that is a door that uh, muslims should stay away from any other questions with what we've taken before we so we don't waste any time Next book, inshallah, is a long book, as I mentioned. It's on the, the seerah of the Messiah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and more specifically on how he dealt with different people. So as we know, he lived in the community. There were his family, his children, his wives, his uh, relatives, his friends, his enemies, the Muslimun at large. And inshallah, uh, we'll go through that and you'll enjoy that book. Bismillah. Yeah, there's nothing else we'll see. What is the yeah? What is the title of the book or the author? Uh, I think they've translated it in English as "Interactions of the Greatest Leader." Sheikh uh, Muhammad Al Munajid. Is some of his books have been translated into English? Yeah, I'll mm -hmm. send you the book, and we can start from uh, tomorrow. Inshallah. Allah, for those who are new, for those who've uh, never joined one of these sessions, generally, uh, we have our fiqh as well as uh, our normal school lessons, subject lessons, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And this is the first reading lesson or uh, reading uh, meetup we've had. And uh, inshallah, next time we'll stream this to so anybody else who wants to follow. They can follow. Remember, 10% rule way. Uh, you may have 100 people in the group. From those 100, uh, I can tell you that maybe maybe 10, 10 read. About 10, fully. 
about 20 or 30 read and others, but there's no harm because a person may not read today, tomorrow, but that one message or the fact that they were in a group of, uh, they were with a group of people who encouraged them toward, towards goodness, sometimes a benefit one of you may have shared may be the reason for them to uh, change later on in life. It may be two, three, four, five, ten years later. So never, ever look down upon a good deed, a good benefit. Because remember, those who are into evil, those who share evil, those who promote evil, those who teach evil, they work day and night, day and night. Uh, and uh, they work with uh, Satan. Uh, Shaitan is the one who inspires them. So what about us who uh, claim to be uh, calling to goodness, etc.? We've also got to make an effort. Allah, those few words we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness, make our reading that which is beneficial, and uh, make our reading that which is uh, his witness for us. Ameen.